member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my privilege, Mr. Speaker, to rise to speak on the, the latest tabled omnibus budget bill on behalf of uh, the constituents of Edmonton Strathcona. And I think many across uh, Western Canada uh, will be discouraged that there isn't much of a debate on this bill being allowed because of closure once again. What is particular concern to those of us in the official opposition, I know will be shared by my constituents, is the fact that once again, we have a large omnibus budget bill over 300 pages, which includes many policy and legal changes which merit discussion uh, before the appropriate committee to give opportunity for Canadians to come, come forward and testify, the appropriate experts, and frankly, Mr. Speaker, the opportunity to question the appropriate ministers. Here we have many policy uh, matters, including, for example, uh, changes to the appointments to the Supreme Court of Canada, where we were supposed to direct our questions to whom? The Minister of Finance. So this is a complete perversion, frankly, of the proceedings in the House of Commons. And uh, once again, we're calling for this to end. Uh, we uh, have requested many changes, but the government just seems to persist and does not want debate, does not want engagement of Canadians in these important matters. We're doing our best to try to hold the government accountable on spending, and that is our constitutional responsibility. Before, Mr. Speaker, I will uh, speak to some of the matters that are on this bill. Because of limited time, I will have to pick and choose. I would like, Mr. Speaker, to mention the things that we do not find in the budget bill. Uh, first and foremost, we see nothing towards addressing the inequities that our Indigenous Canadians have suffered over far too many decades. There is no mention of new dollars to end the 2% cap on First Nation education and services. No additional money to, to uh, expedite specific and comprehensive land claims. And Mr. Speaker, I find this dumbfounding. Um, Banks have called for action on this. First Nations have called for this. The provincial premiers have called for this, for this government to step up to the plate and put additional uh, staffing on and uh, resources to expedite the land claims, including along the path of the proposed gateway pipeline. And yet what do we see in this budget? Absolutely nothing to expedite that process. Uh, we have heard concerns from those who have already signed on to comprehensive land claims. Where's the money to finally deliver? on the commitments made under those claims. Those Canadians would like to participate in the economy that this uh, uh, government lauds, but they are not able to move forward and participate in the economy because they're struggling just to get by. No additional money for an inquiry into missing and murdered women, despite the pleas by Indigenous families across this country. Um, just a travesty that still no money for this inquiry, which even the UN is calling for and no commitment of additional monies which will likely be needed to complete the Truth and Reconciliation Review and the release of data. No money, Mr. Speaker, for our universities and technical schools in crisis, even in Alberta. Uh, we faced uh, the travesty of deep cuts to our universities and to our technical colleges at a time when supposedly this government is saying they support the training so that all Canadians can participate in this burgeoning resource economy. They're being sliced. Where is the federal government? They could be helping with that. Where is the new money to reduce tuition so all Canadians can have access to advanced education? Consumers. Well, a lot of talk about helping consumers. What's the highest cost that most Canadian families face? Their electricity and their power bills. And yet we have pleaded, Canadians have pleaded to bring back the incentive and the support for home energy retrofits and retrofits for small and medium businesses so they can compete. Nothing in this budget to assist those consumers. Pensions, despite the fact that almost all pre premiers now are on side to be beefing up the uh, Canada Pension Plan, unions are behind it, majority of Canadians, nothing in this budget. Agriculture, this is one that really saddens me, Mr. Speaker. Every time we stand up to speak, we get all of this talk back about the glories of how all uh, Canadians are going to be able to benefit from CETA. Uh, the proposed new trade uh, agreement with Europe. And yet, this government, in its wisdom, killed an 80-year-old program which gave assistance to small and medium farmers in the prairies. And that, that provided special research to make sure that on these sensitive lands that you could farm uh, sustainably. There were community pastures where the small and medium farmers could graze their cattle. 
and it was a very successful program for both enabling sustainability of the pastures and for these important members of our economy to continue contributing their tax dollars. Well, what did the government do? They shut down those programs. In fact, they not only shut them down, they, they sold off uh, uh, the bulls that were provided to provide for more cattle, and they wouldn't even provide the feed in the interim period until the farmers could get away from harvest and put a bid on the, bill, on the bulls. So I am told this summer, Mr. Speaker, having met with many of these farmers, that they're being forced to sell off their herds. Well, how is that helping all Canadian farmers to contribute to the economy and potentially benefit from this trade agreement? So, Mr. Speaker, those are just some of the many matters that are missing from this budget bill, supposedly helping all Canadians to participate in the economy. Firstly, Mr. Speaker, I would like to speak to Division 7, Part 3, on disposal of the Dominion coal blocks. Now, these lands in British Columbia have been the subject of a lot of controversy lately. Um, there actually is an agreement um, on those lands between the government of British Columbia and six First Nations in British Columbia, whereby by those First Nations are wanting to undertake forestry activity and have economic opportunity. Secondly, um, it's the understanding that some of these lands will in fact not be sold off uh, for metallurgical coal to be shipped to China or for coal gas methane. Instead, some of these lands are supposed to be protected for a future Flathead National Park or Wildlife Preserve. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking forward to clarification in this House to both the First Nations who are directly impacted by these decisions and to the citizenry who have been uh, negotiating in good faith with the government on uh, setting aside these lands for the benefit of all Canadians. Secondly, um, Mr. Speaker, I want to speak to the issue of uh, the phase out of accelerated capital costs in mining. And I simply have a question, Mr. Speaker, that I look forward to having answered by one of the members of the government. This government is saying that they want to actually incent and to encourage uh, mining entrepreneurs to create jobs and income in Canada, and particularly in the North. And so I'm looking forward to an explanation for, for why these particular um, accelerated capital costs are being phased out. I know that the government has committed uh, through the G8 that they will phase out and reduce their uh, um, incentives and uh, benefits to the fossil fuel industry. But I remain puzzled at this, and uh, our party is, is very supportive of, uh, of the mining sector, and we look forward to having an explanation for that one. The third area is uh, the McKenzie Gas Project Impact Act. Very simply, um, what the government is doing is they are shutting down a fund which was established in negotiation with all the communities along the McKenzie, whereby they could be compensated for any impacts uh, that were social or economic in nature. And it was a fund where they specifically apportioned to the individual communities. Um, I look forward to an explanation why unilaterally this government has chosen to shut down that fund put those monies into general revenues and have the minister have total discretion on how to disperse those funds. It does not sound, sound like cooperative federalism uh, with the Northwest Territories and the people of the North. Uh, the final uh, matters I'd like to speak to, Mr. Speaker, is the changes to worker health and safety. Um, deeply distressing that there has been a, a decision to take away the issue of defining of dangerous work from a de definition that has been provided in legislation, which provides a broad scope of work where a worker may consider it dangerous, they then, under legislation, have the right to refuse to work. Instead, the government is assigning that total power to the discretion of the minister to narrow that down. Why is that great concern? Because this government has been prosecuted, have been convicted of violating their own health and safety laws and are awaiting sentencing of up to $100,000 and probation. Is this the, they, the way they respond to their atrocious actions of failing to have basic health and safety uh, protections in place for Canadian federal workers? Thank you. I look forward to the questions, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, I'd like to congratulate the member from uh, Edmonton for her fine, uh, fine uh, speech here today, but uh, during her speech she talked about cutbacks to community colleges, which uh, obviously affects uh, tradesmen and uh, trades, tradespersons, I should say. 
And I've been sitting on the natural resources now probably for a couple of years. And every time we get companies uh, coming in to uh, answer some of our uh, questions in the Natural Resources Committee, their biggest complaint is that they, ha they have no tradespeople, electricians, welders, machinists, mechanics. And now it's become obvious to me that the members, the conservative members of the Natural Resources Committee have not been listening to what these people are saying. So can, can the, the member from Edmonton please tell me uh, why she thinks these members are not listening to what uh, people are saying at the Natural Resources Committee. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Honourable Member who does fantastic work on our behalf in the natural resources area. Um, the concern that we have raised repeatedly, Mr. Speaker, is this. Uh, the government speaks of uh, the fact that we have a great skills shortage. And apparently there's some question about that. The experts are debating that right now uh, in the media. If we have this big skills shortage, and if they wish to fill it with indi Indigenous Canadians, then they have to give them the basic education and skills so that they can compete and apply for those jobs. The second issue is Indigenous Canadians should have equal right to any other Canadian to decide what they want to be educated in and what kind of job they want to pursue. They don't necessarily all want to be welders and pipe fitters. A good number of them do. But a good number of them want to be doctors and teachers and parliamentarians. And so we remain deeply disturbed that the government is not removing this 2% funding cap on education. Many, many, increasing number of Indigenous youth are completing high school. But there's also a cap on getting the assistance to go to higher education. And so there's many frustrated out there who would like to pursue other jobs. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg South Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to ask the uh, honourable member who has just spoken if there are any businesses in her riding who might benefit from the accelerated cost allowance, which uh, we have just put in to Bill C-4 and in our new budget. Um, you know, this is going to make an impact of $1.4 billion annually. Uh, or $1.4 billion just for the two-year extension. That is significant. So I'd like to know if there are any businesses in her riding who might benefit. I'd also like to know if there are any people with disabilities in her riding who might benefit from the $15 million annually in perpetuity, Mr. Speaker, that we are funding so that people who live with disabilities can be an integral part of our community, have more accessibility, and be able to contribute. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for her question. Yes, in fact, there are many uh, uh, business and consulting firms in my riding who would love to compete. But the concern is, is that are they now going to be competing with Europeans who are trying to go for the municipal and the provincial contracts? So it's a double-edged sword. I know that many of them will welcome the opportunity to potentially be able to work in Europe. The problem is one of the biggest sectors that we're building in my riding is the energy efficiency sector. And in the, this government, it's wisdom, yank the very incentives that would create um, their expertise, not only for Canada, but to go overseas. This government also has, has shredded any incentives towards the development of renewable energy expertise and technology in my riding. And therefore, they cannot go into Europe and compete. In the meantime, the Europeans have moved forward and they're now going to be selling that equipment to us. I think that's a sad day. It's time for the government to step up and put its money actually into building our sectors so they can compete equally with the Europeans. 